Hello, and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's Select Science webinar, which today takes the form of a Biosafety Cabinet Masterclass. My name is Sarah Thomas, and I will be moderating today's presentation. So I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Drew Pippin. Drew is National Sales Manager at New Air, and today he will be discussing Biosafety Cabinet operational theory, as well as important considerations for selecting the right Biosafety Cabinet for your laboratory. Just before I hand over to our speaker, I'd like to mention a couple of things. Please feel free to ask any questions for the Q&A session at any time during the webinar by clicking on the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. And to view the presentation in full screen, uh, you just need to click on the bottom tab at the right of the media player window. And finally, an on-demand version of this webinar will be available to watch in a few days' time. So without further delay, I would like to hand over to Drew for today's presentation, and I would like to thank him for presenting to us today. So please go ahead, Drew. Thank you, Sarah. So as Sarah mentioned, my name is Drew Pippin, and I am the National Sales Manager with New Air. Uh, New Air is a manufacturer of laboratory equipment, such as CO2 incubators, ultra-low temperature freezers, uh, benchtop centrifuges, and biological safety cabinets, which will be the topic of our discussion today. So today I'll be going through the different classes and types of biological safety cabinets and how they function. I'll also discuss things to consider before selecting a biological safety cabinet, including risk assessments, current and future processes, and compliance requirements and then also address the most important questions to ask before purchasing a biological safety cabinet to ensure that it fulfills the needs of your laboratory. So to begin, we want to look at what the purpose of a biological safety cabinet is. And it really is designed to provide three basic types of protection. Personnel protection from harmful agents inside the cabinet, product protection, to avoid any contamination of your work or experiment, and environmental protection from the contaminants contained within the cabinet. The personnel protection of the biological safety cabinet is provided through a dynamic air barrier through the front access opening of the biological safety cabinet. As you can see here by the illustration of the picture, we use what is used is, a, is an airflow velocity of 100 feet per minute of a minimum velocity to provide that protection from like, any contaminants from leaking out of the cabinet and affecting the laboratory space or the technicians working within the cabinet. Product protection is, is done by using true laminar airflow with a supply HEPA filter on the top part of the work zone to HEPA filter any of the air that goes down onto the work zone. And this is usually done and is accomplished with a 60 feet per minute airflow velocity down onto the work tray to provide that sterility in the work zone and guard against any potential for cross-contamination. So it's protecting the product within the work zone. There are different classes and types of biological safety cabinets, and that's what we'll kind of go through at this point. The first class would be a class one biological safety cabinet. This is designed as 100% total exhaust. The inflow velocity through that front access opening is at 75 feet per minute. And what this cabinet is doing is it pulling in room air directly in through the work access opening. It is going over the work surface and then it is exhausted either back into the room or to the outside through an exhaust system um, through the top of the cabinet. So this is only providing personnel uh, and environmental protection only. It's not providing any product protection in the work zone. So as I said, this can be recirculated back into the room space, or you can always exhaust it to the outside via a thimble exhaust transition or a hard connection um, to the exhaust system. Moving on from class one, we get into our first portion of class two cabinets, which is our class two type A1 biological safety cabinet. This cabinet functions with 30% of the airflow is exhausted either back into the laboratory space 
or connected to the exhaust system and exhausted to the outside. And 70% of the airflow is actually recirculated within the cabinet through the HEPA filtration. The inflow velocity on the class two type A1 is 75 feet per minute. And because of that, your, the BSL level usage for an A1 cabinet is either BSL level one or two. And this cabinet can only, it provides personnel, products, and environmental protection. And because it's only providing 75 feet per minute of inflow velocity, you can use it for minute amounts of non-volatile toxic chemicals if it is exhausted to the outside. A1 cabinets are not typically found very much in today's laboratories. And instead, we're finding more of, and the most common, is a class two type A2. As you can see, it's very similar in the design aspect in that it's 30, percent of the air is exhausted, 70 percent of the air is recirculated, um, but the biggest difference is the inflow velocity, which is 100 feet per minute minimum. So this, is, this allows you to use in BSL levels one, two, or three, and instead of um, just having non-volatile toxic chemicals, you can actually use minute amounts of volatile toxic chemicals in an A2 cabinet as long as it is exhausted to the outside. So an A2 cabinet gives you a little bit of ability to either recirculate back into the room, which is very common, but if you are using some volatile toxic chemicals, you can exhaust to the outside. Exhaustion through an A2 cabinet is done by a canopy or thimble transition, which is pictured here on this slide. And this is designed uh, with a low airflow alarm, so if the exhaust system Gets, has a low airflow and is not able to exhaust the air to the outside, it'll go into alarm to let the, the users know in the lab space that you're not getting proper airflow to exhaust the air to the outside. And what it'll do is the cabinet itself will continue to work, but it'll push that airflow back into the lab space through that opening that you're seeing in, in the symbol. Once the airflow stabilizes again with the exhaust system, that flap closes, the exhaust alarm is silenced, and it'll go back to functioning normally and exhausting the air to the outside. From a class two type A2, we move to a class two type B cabinet. And this would be our B2 is the first one we'll look at. This is 100% total exhaust. So there's no recirculation within the cabinet itself like the class two A1 and A2 cabinet. Because it's 100% total exhaust, type B cabinets must be hard connected to the building exhaust system. And they must be interlocked with the internal blower with audible and visual alarms for exhaust failure. So if, there's, if there isn't sufficient exhaust flow, the cabinet itself will also shut down to guard against pressurizing the exhaust ductwork within the facility. From class two type B2 cabinets, we move to class two type B1 cabinets. As you can see, this is kind of the inverse of what a class two type A2 does. So it's 70% of the air is exhausted and 30% is actually recirculated within the cabinet. The benefit for a B1 cabinet is how it, it performs as far as you have the back half of the work zone, as you can see by these purple lines on the, on the illustration, that airflow is not recirculated in the back half. So it functions very much like a B2, where it's one air change and out. If you work in the front half of the work zone, that's where it functions more like an A2 cabinet, where it has recirculation of the airflow. So the, the benefits of a B1 cabinet is that it does give you the, the kind of the benefits of a B2 in the certain aspect of working in the back half of the work zone, um, but it does allow you to be able to connect to more, a lot easier to exhaust systems as it requires significantly less exhaust volume than that of a B2. So the CFM and static pressure requirements of a B1 are a lot less than that of a B2 cabinet. The last biological safety cabinet that we'll talk about today is a class three. 
and this is also known as a, as a glove box. These are a 100% total exhaust. They're maintained under negative pressure at a minimum of 0 0.5 inches of, of water gauge or static pressure. Um, they're double HEPA filtered, and they're typically you know, used only in BSL-4 laboratories. So they're really used for toxic powders and BSL-4 agents. Um, you know, and that's what they're used for, not in the common everyday cell culture, tissue culture laboratories. So we've gone through the different types and classes of biological safety cabinets. But before you can make a selection, we need to take into, into account four different aspects. The first is risk assessment. It's looking at what you're working with, what pathogen are you working with, and making sure that you're taking into account your protocol um, to, to ensure that you're protecting not only yourself, um, but the laboratory environment. Looking at the facility, is the BSC or biological safety cabinet going to fit in the proposed laboratory space? Where is the placement of the BSC? Is it going to work with the current flow of traffic within that laboratory space? Processes and costs you know, involved with a biological safety cabinet. We'll look at those. And also compliance. You know, what regulatory bodies are there to guide you through what you should be using for biological safety cabinets? So well, before we start talking about risk assessment, what, what is risk? We have a couple definitions here. There's the ISO definition where the risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So with this definition, uncertainties include events that may, may or may not happen, and uncertainties are caused by ambiguity or lack of information. It also includes both negative and positive impacts on objectives. If you look at the Occupational Health and Safety Advisory Services, risk is the product of the probability of a hazard resulting in adverse event times the severity of the event. There's different ways to look at risk. When you look at risk, there are different risk-based approaches you'll want to take. And the biggest thing is to look at the likelihood of consequence, also and the likelihood of the or the severity of the consequence. So if both the likelihood and severity of the consequence is high, then risk must be well managed with engineering controls and standard operating procedures. So by this, you'll want to do a risk assessment. And there are several factors that define the risk of a particular protocol. These include the pathogen or agent handled, the procedures to be used, and the experience and health status of the personnel performing the work. When we look at the agent handled, the first step is to learn as much as possible about that agent. So the greater the agent's pathogenicity, communicability, and the longer it can survive in the environment, the greater the risk. Then we want to look at procedures followed. You don't want to begin handling the pathogen until you have experts' knowledge of the issues. You must also determine the risk group classification of the pathogen. And the NIH publishes a risk group classification list that you can reference. And then you want to take into account personnel factors. These are the personnel working with the pathogen. Are they experienced, well-trained, and capable of performing the necessary tasks? Are they healthy and have a healthy immune system? And are they comfortable in general in performing the proposed work? So the risk groups are, are identified here, groups one, two, three, and four. And when you go across the individual risk and community, community risk, you can see the differences. So risk group one has a no or low individual risk as well as a no or low community risk, all the way up to four which has an individual risk of very high as well as a community risk of high. So defining of what your risk group that your agent might fall into kind of looks at what risk is on yourself as an individual and also the community as well. 
And when you take these risk groups and start applying them to biosafety levels, they cross like this. So risk group one would typically fall into BSL level one, and a BSL level is appropriate for work with defined and characterized strains of microorganisms that are not known to cause disease in healthy adult humans. Risk group two would fall into BSL-2 categories, and that's appropriate for a broad spectrum of indigenous moderate risk agents present in the community and associated with human disease of varying severity. Risk group three would fall into the containment or BSL level three, which is appropriate for work with indigenous or exotic agents with a potential for respiratory transmission and which may cause serious and potential lethal infection. And the last group, risk group four, would fall into BSL level four, which is appropriate for dangerous and exotic agents which pose a high individual risk of life-threatening disease. As you can see, the different BSC classes that we discussed in the beginning of the presentation all also have alignment with BSL level agents used. They have <clears throat> non-volatile toxic chemicals and volatile toxic chemicals and radionucleotides listed as well, and if they are, be able to be used in a minute amount or a small amount, depending on the different types and classifications of the biological safety cabinet. For example, you can see as a class two type A1, it's really used for BSL-1 or 2 agents, and it's only really used for non-volatile toxic chemicals and cannot be used for volatile toxic chemicals. As you can see, for a class 2 type A2, you can use for non-volatile and volatile, but if you are using volatile toxic chemicals, it has to be exhausted to the outside, and it'd be a minute quantity. So factors to consider in a risk assessment are as follows. Is the agent indigenous or non-indigenous? What is the pathogenicity of the agent and infectious dose? If there is an exposure, what is the outcome? What are the routes of infection, whether it's natural or in the lab setting? What is the concentration and volume of the agent? Is there any data from previous experiments from the field or animal studies that you can gather? Um, what are the lab activities planned? And what is the availability of vaccines um, to guard against w working with this agent? When you look at the break the chain of infection here, the reservoir is the habitat the agent normally lives, and the portal of escape is the path to which the pathogen leaves the host. And then it could transmit whether it's direct, with direct contact, or indirect via airborne. And there's practices and using of equipment to guard against that. Once there is transmission, what is the port of entry, or route of entry, to infect the host, or effective dose? So the portal of entry is the manner in which the pathogen enters the susceptible host. So we guard against that by using PPE. If it does make make it to a susceptible host, what is the immunization process? And what is then, after that point, surveilling that, that host and the incubation period? So after risk assessment, it leads to risk management. So right now, risk assessment establishes the biosafety level, and then risk management includes all the practices and procedures established to mitigate the risk and minimize exposure. This is done by the personnel may require more training, they require vaccination, and additional experience. If there's specialized PPE, that may be specified. Work may be performed in a specialized containment equipment, such as a biological safety cabinet. And then work may be performed in a specialized design facility that prevent the release of the agent into the environment, such as containment BSL level three or level four labs. One of the biggest concerns when working in lab space is the generation of aerosols, which are solid particles suspended in a gas 
such as air. So virtually all laboratory activities give rise to aerosols of some magnitude. And aerosols are known to spread infectious agents throughout the laboratory and sometimes the building. So because of that, there needs to be clearly a control on aerosols within the lab setting. So how do you prevent aerosol exposure? You can do so through engineering controls, so containment of aerosol generating events, direction of when you're, if you're using a centrifugation, for instance, um, in the lab setting. If you centrifuge something, when you open up that bucket to access your samples, do so under a biological safety cabinet, under that unidirectional airflow, the HEPA filtration. Also applying administrative controls. So making sure that the equipment you're using is certified and it's, it's up to the current standards and meets what needs to, to perform correctly. Have proper training for the people using the equipment. And obviously wearing PPE and including respirators to guard against any issues that could rise from aerosols. Once you take all of the risk involvement involved into making that decision, then you can start looking at a BSC assessment uh, for the facility. So the first thing you want to look at is the laboratory services. What electricity is required to run that product? Is ventilation in the lab appropriate? Do you need to exhaust the biological safety cabinet to the outside if you're working with something that's volatile. You also want to take into account the ceiling height to make sure that it's going to fit and be able to work at the work surface height that you need in the lab. Also measuring doorways to make sure that getting that piece of equipment into the lab space will not be an issue. Another item is looking at personnel movement within the lab. What are the door movements? you know, pass-throughs, airflow patterns, all that must be analyzed. You know, looking at the design criteria within the lab itself, is it a BSL 1, 2, 3, or 4 space? And you also must look at the HVAC, the facility air handling system, to ensure if you, are, if you do require exhaustion to the outside, can it handle that exhaust requirement of that particular biological safety cabinet? When you look at the HVAC compatibility, so it's looking at if the BSC is exhausted, it requires a constant volume. So on the beginning slides, I did show the exhaust requirements for an A2 cabinet and a B1, and that listed the CFM and static. So that's a constant volume that needs to be made, uh, need to be met at the cabinet itself. So it's making sure that you can achieve those, those values. Looking at laboratory balance, is it positive or negative? Looking at the laboratory ventilation rates. Looking at all this, review the system dynamics, personnel movement, door movement, and pass-throughs. And also you want to look at the national and local code to make sure that you're following all the guidelines in place. Once you take all the HVAC into account, you can start looking at where you want to locate the biological safety cabinet within the lab. You want to isolate the cabinet away from doorways and windows. You want to have the low flow traffic. So you don't want to put this right by a door where people are walking in and out of the lab, which could affect the performance of the cabinet. You also want to know where the ventilation registers are within the lab space. And as you can see in the diagram, the two locations where the lab guard could possibly be, they would block those registers so they're not blowing that air directly at the biological safety cabinet. Because if they are blowing air directly at the unit itself, it could affect the performance of the cabinet, which could, in turn, make it so it doesn't perform appropriately, which is not going to protect the product, protect the personnel or the environment as it should. Looking at the process cost of a Class II BSC, as you can see, the lowest purchase price, installation cost, cost to exhaust, operating cost, and also offering the lowest level of safety would be a recirculated biological safety cabinet, like a type A1 or A2. If you go on up, the costs rise from A2 exhausted to B1 to B2 because you're exhausting much more of the air, um, and also the initial purchase price, installation cost, all of that goes up as well. 
but by doing so, the safety for removing those gases and vapors goes up. So it really goes into what is the most important. Are you working with high levels of gas and vapors that you need to safely exhaust to the outside? If so, that might take precedent over that initial purchase price or the cost to exhaust. And that's where you want to look at a class two type B1 or B2 cabinet. If you're not working with, with uh, gases or vapors, you can just re, you know, look at using a recirculated A2 cabinet. And that's where you'll have a lower purchase price, installation cost, and obviously you're not exhausting it, so you don't have to worry about those costs either. Once you kind of look at those items, you'll come up with five basic questions you want to ask yourself when looking to purchase a biological safety cabinet. The first question is what needs to be protected? Is it just the product, which is accomplished by using a, a clean air workstation, or, or some people call a horizontal laminar flow clean bench? What this is doing is providing HEPA filtered air that's blowing right over the work surface to provide that sterility in the work zone for product protection, but since the airflow is blowing right at the user, it's not providing personnel protection. The next step would be, is it providing personnel and environmental protection, much like the class one that we discussed early on in the presentation. So it's not providing any of that product protection, but if you're working with some toxic powders that you don't need product protection, but you need protection as far as for the personnel for, then you can look at a class one. And the most common would be the personnel, product, and environment as far as the protection which is offered in both a class two or class three biological safety cabinet. The next question, what are all the different types of work to be done in the cabinet? So are you doing normal procedures for cell culturing? Are you using any of equipment, whether it needs to be inside the unit itself, like a centrifuge or a microscope? Are you doing animal surgery, where maybe you need a larger access opening to be able to facilitate the movement of mouse cages into and out of the work zone? Are you using any cell processing like automation where you might need a larger custom biological safety cabinet to house that automation system? So it's asking all those questions and it's defining really what you're working with to help get a better idea of what kind of cabinet would best work for your needs. The next question is what types and quantities of chemical vapors will be generated in the BSC? Are you working with anesthesia gas, radioisotopes, phenols, chloroform, etc.? You'll want to consult your facility safety department and your dustinal hygiene. So you'll want to consult your EHS department and find out if, what they recommend with what you're using. And then if your cabinet does require exhaust, is there appropriate location for the cabinet and the facility duct system? So do you have a drop that you can connect the cabinet to to exhaust the airflow to the outside? Whether it be a canopy connected type A1, A1 or A2 cabinet or a hard connected type B1 or B2 biological safety cabinet. And then lastly, if the cabinet is exhausted, what are the effects on the cabinet of low or no exhaust flow and also on the laboratory itself? Looking at the biological safety cabinet, how it performs if their exhaust flow is lower, you run out of exhaust flow. You know, if the laboratory air balance, how does that affect that? And if there is lower or no exhaust flow, is there audible alarms or visual alarms to let the, the personnel know that their safety could be compromised and they should exit the laboratory at that time? When asking yourself those questions, then you're able to try to determine what class and type biological safety cabinet and configuration might work best for you in the lab setting. Whether it be a class one, class two type A2, whether it's recirculating the airflow back into the laboratory space or exhausting to the outside, a class two type B cabinet that's hard connected and exhausting the airflow to the outside, or a class three glove box. So once you make that determination, then it's time to start and look at different manufacturers out there. But things to consider when you're looking at different manufacturers of biological safety cabinets is looking at their performance specifications, making sure they meet the minimum standards listed, which in the United States and in Canada 
would be the NSF ANSI 49 requirement, and in Europe, it would be the EN standard. When you start looking at that, you also want to look at the life cycle cost. Typically, a biological safety cabinet average life cycle is about 15 years. So you want to look at the energy consumption of the cabinet. And also take into account the filter load capacity. The biggest expense after the initial purchase of the biological safety cabinet is the changing of HEPA filters after they load. So are the filters going to load in three to five years? Or are they going to last up to eight to ten plus years? Obviously, the longer the filter lasts, the less you'll need to change, which will lower your life cycle cost. Another item to look at is the construction. How is the unit constructed? Is it using silicone rivets in the design, or is it an all-welded you know, um, piece of equipment? Is it using 16 or 18 gauge metal or 20 gauge? Another item is a control type, analog versus digital. So what type of control system is used on the cabinet to provide the information that you need? Is there an airflow alarm to, alarm, to let you know if the airflows are falling out of the specified range? Ergonomics is important. If you're going to be working in the biological safety cabinet for eight hours, is it going to allow you to be more comfortably without blocking the airflow of the cabinet? And serviceability. Because these biological safety cabinets are designed to last 15 plus years, you're going to have to provide some sort of service on it through the lifetime of the cabinet. So is that service easily accessible? You know, to minimize downtime and reduce cost? Or is that service going to require more dismantling of the cabinet to access certain, certain uh, important items, which can increase the downtime in the laboratory and also increase cost? So that is the end of my presentation. So at this point, we're going to start the Q&A session. So I can answer some of the questions that might have come in during the presentation. Great, thank you, Drew, for a very informative presentation. So as you mentioned, it's now time for the question and answer session. So our first question is, if I'm working in a BSL2 space, what dictates that I should be working in a certain class or type of biological safety cabinet? Okay. So the first thing I want to do is, is perform a risk assessment, you know, for the procedure. Uh, work with your EHS department and, and really kind of look at what you're doing. Once you've kind of completed all of that, you'll want to go through the five basic questions. You know, looking at um, what needs to be protected, what are all the different types of work to be done in the cabinet, you know, what types of quantities of chemical vapors are being generated during your process? Do you have sufficient exhaust if you need to exhaust it to the outside? Um, and once you kind of narrow all that down, that should help point you in the right direction of what biological safety cabinet configuration will work best for your lab. Great. Thanks, Drew. And we have another question here. Can you elaborate on the effects of low or no exhaust flow when looking at an exhausted type A cabinet versus an exhausted type B cabinet? So when you have low or, or no exhaust flow while using an exhausted class two type A2 biological safety cabinet, the cabinet itself will continue to run, but the exhausted airflow will be recirculated back into the laboratory space. So this means that the cabinet will still be providing product protection in the work zone as well as biological protection, but the vapor protection is lost because it's pushing that airflow back into the lab space. For a class two type B biological safety cabinet, that since they're interlocked with the exhaust system, if the exhaust system fails, then the cabinet motor stops as to not pressurize that exhaust system or duct work. Because of this, you'll not only lose the vapor protection, but biological protection as well as product protection in the work zone. So any work being done in a type B cabinet at the time of exhaust failure would be compromised. Thanks, Drew. We've got time for one last question. Are agents classified in a certain risk groups handled at the biosafety level corresponding to their risk group classification? 
So this is what I went over earlier as well. So in many cases, you can simply follow the work practices, engineering controls, and facility requirements identified in the CDC slash NIH BMDL, um, which stands for Biosafety in Microbiological and Biomedical Laboratories. So for instance, risk two groups, um, those risk group two agents are handled normally in BSL-2 facilities, following BSL-2 work procedures, and using BSL-2 safety equipment. But this is not always the case. It really is based on a risk assessment. Sometimes the procedures used in the protocol and certain factors associated with the agent will modify the risk and allow or require deviations from the BMBL. So for an example, um, let's say you're working with the rabies vaccine, which per the NIH risk group classification list, is a risk two agent. So ordinary researchers would follow the biosafety level two requirements. But say for this particular laboratory, they're growing large volumes of the rabies virus and isolating the virus in a centrifuge. As you know, risk, rabies is a risk two agent that is transmitted through bites or breaks in the skin. But the laboratory procedures that are laid out in this example can create aerosol levels that are not possible or seen in nature and can create airborne concentrations of the virus that can result in infections by inhalation, a route to transmission not found in, na in nature. So in this case, the work culturing and isolating rabies performed should be performed in a BSL level three containment, even though the controls uh, for the rabies is a risk two agent. Great, thank you very much, Drew. So that's all we have time for today. So. Uh, thank you to everyone joining us online and for your interesting questions and to Drew for his informative discussion and presentation. I hope that you found this a worthwhile session. If we didn't manage to answer your questions, please feel free to email me at sarah at selectscience.net and I will follow up with your questions for Drew personally. And if you'd like to listen again to today's webinar or to invite a friend to listen, it will be available to watch in a few days' time. So goodbye and thank you once again for joining us.